this is fun normal here. This is 10 to 8, so I look forward to our study tonight. And to you that are not following along as far as Bible marks, and I know a lot of you are, and those of you that are not, uh, the, the message will be the same. But what's on the board is a few of the, of the book, chapter, and verses of Scripture that we're using to illustrate what the Word of God said about false teaching. Now, I do not want to in any way indicate that this is, <clears throat> that this is total comprehensive. There's a ton of other verses, Old and New Testament. So therefore, I've gone through and I've selected a few that I felt like would flow together good. And the majority, not every time, but the majority of the time, I like to go from left to right to make it easier to follow. And especially if you're using it during a home study, it's a little easier to go along the way. And then I have different Bibles that I use in my home studies. And I have a stack of about eight Bibles that were identical. And then I would use that if, if the person I had a lady called, oh, I guess it this week or last week, and uh, she didn't have a Bible. And then we had another gentleman that called, and Brother Bobby uh, bought him a Bible and sent it to him. So there are different people. It's hard to imagine not having a Bible. But when they do have a Bible, then we use, obviously, go with theirs. But if they don't, we take, I take one that matches what I have. We'll go up a page number, and then we begin to talk about different aspects of the Scripture. Well, as you see on the board, we're going to begin, and we have seven points that we want to make several reference points. And again, please understand, if you've got a verse that burns within you that will share with people about false teachers, then feel free to, to modify these. These are your Bible markings. I'm just giving you some uh, recommendations to consider, and then you go from there. But number one is from Acts, the 15th chapter, and verse 1. Now, Acts 15 is really a, a, just a Jim Daniel chapter. It is one that has a lot of valuable information. This is the same chapter what Paul and Barnabas would do not cover tonight, but they have a conflict. And now, before the gathering to that conflict, then we have a situation whereby now we got somebody going out and teaching false doctrine. Look at it. The very first verse of Acts 15, the Word of God says the following, And certain men... Which came down from Judea, they taught the brethren, and they said, Except you be circumcised after the matter of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, the Gentile obviously did not like that type of teaching. The Jews who would promote such a thing, not every one of the Jews, but some of the Jews did, and let me tell you what, that didn't go over at all. And but if you look at verse two, You'll see Paul and Barnabas took them to task. But here's what happened. Look at verse 2. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go to Jerusalem under the apostles and elders about this question. Now this is very, very important. <coughs> Paul and Barnabas ran up against these men, and they were influential people. People were willing to listen to what they had to say, and they succumbed to that. Well, Paul and Barnabas, after they found out, they had a pretty significant head-on discussion, but they were not gaining any heavy ground, so they went back to Jerusalem, where the apostles were, where these men came from, Jerusalem, they went back to Jerusalem, and they told the apostles, here's what's going on. These guys that came out from here are, and this is where you kind of think about your own congregation, uh, preachers who have been ordained from a current congregation, and then if, if a trouble arises down the road, people go back to their home church and say, hey, we got a problem here with the guy that you ordained and sent out. Well, that's similar to the way it is here. I don't know about the ordination part, but they went out from Jerusalem. And Paul and Barnabas said, listen, we got a problem. These people are teaching this. Well, I'm not read all of Acts 15, but false teaching was prevalent in that day. And as they were beginning to deal with this, they talked amongst themselves, and finally they decided, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to write them a letter. 
and they wrote a letter denouncing the view and giving other instructions. Now, some of your modern version, I'll preach in the King James, but, but some of your modern version make this a little easier because what it would do, if your Bible indents a certain portion of the scripture and it will indent, I've seen several that indented this letter. And that way it's real easy to see where it starts, where it stops. And, it, and you understand more that this is really a letter, just like we would do today. Write a letter if we chose to and mail it away. Well, they wrote this letter and they finally laid this issue to rest. But you know today, and I've been preaching for 48 years. I've never had to deal with that topic. There's a lot of issues that existed during the first century church that we never have to deal with. I remember one series of years, maybe three to five, I had a sermon entitled False Teaching Found in Scripture. And it was pointing out different things like this, the teaching that was done that was false, like Acts 15 verse 1 for an example. And then after church, Brother Richard Butter, I was older than meeting up at his home church in Butter Ridge, uh, West Virginia, and then after service that we were talking about it, and, he, and I said, well, what would you say is one of the reasons that people draw the wrong conclusion on religious matters? And he stopped and he pondered for a moment. He said, people are reading the wrong book. That is so true. People are reading the wrong book, and books, plural now. You know, and I've cautioned people, and I mentioned this, I think, at the Labor Day meeting in Tennessee and in other meetings across the country, that whenever you go to these religious bookstores, you have to be really on your toes because most of their books are Calvinistic and they're not teaching truth, and you can't just randomly pick up one because you like the cover or you like the title or anything else and just say, I'm going to buy so-and-so this book and give it to them. No, because it's filled with many times garbage. And I will share more about that a little later. But I want you to want everyone to be careful. You can never go wrong with buying somebody a Bible. A good translation. There are many good translations. You know, some of the prominent ones that help people to understand better is like, you know, yeah, of course, King James, which I'm one of the only one here that uses King James. But, hey, King James, New King James, New American Standard Version, NIV with everything about the book of Romans, and um, then you have New English Version is a fast of approaching, a very popular version. And I admit that I haven't read it yet completely, but uh, these other versions I've read numerous of times, but, but I have not read it completely. But I just want everybody to always be careful what you give people encouragement to read because we don't want people to be misled by a good deed that you really meant to be good and it turned out not to be. But, so therefore, if you have, I'll take you for an example, like, and I, I enjoy reading the New American Standard Version, and when I'm doing my regular Bible reading, I'll read a variety of verses, but since I memorized the King James Version, uh, I'm kind of lazy, I guess, but I'd say quoting it and reading the others. That's just my preference at this point. But what we learned in Acts 15, verse 1, this is a false doctrine that in order to solve it, Paul and Barnabas had to travel back to Jerusalem. They had to have a meeting with the apostles. They had to have a meeting with the elders. They all got together. The Bible says for to consider this matter. So there comes the time that we need to get together and brainstorm. And this is a very good way to learn how to handle a church-related issue. This is a Bible example of how to handle that. And so therefore, I want everyone to really remember this and read through it for uh, several more verses and you see that letter and it's really nice and it draws the point home. When well, that is a prime example of false teachers in their day. Now, probably you would never have to discuss that matter with anybody. There may be a time you have to, but I've never had to in my career. But I'll tell you what, the main thing is we learn how to handle conflict when it arises. It does not have to be a blowout. It does not have to be a fist fight. It doesn't have to be any of these negative ways that people typically handle situations. No, this worked out real well. And then that letter 
was given to someone else. If you take it, you go with them to deliver this letter, and case was closed. And that's what we want. So let's learn Acts 15 and how this all played out. Now let's look at Acts 23 and verse 8. Now Acts 23 verse 8 is going to talk about the Sadducees. And I chose this passage. There are many verses that mention the Sadducees. But I chose this verse because it adequately describes what they believe. That's the reason this passage was chosen. In Acts 23rd chapter, verse 8, the Bible said, <coughs> excuse me, let me get my water. Acts 23 and verse 8. <coughs> I have not coughed all day. Here I am. Now look at verse 8 and then define the Sadducees. For the Sadducees say, here it is, there is no resurrection, neither angels, nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. There's a little difference between the Sadducees and the, and the Pharisees, but the Sadducees did not believe in angels, and they didn't believe in resurrection. Let me tell you what, I have dealt with people that did not believe in resurrection numerous of times throughout the years. And there are times there are people in the church who will question certain attributes about the resurrection. But here's the situation. The Sadducees were a prominent little group. It wasn't a large group, but they were a group that did have influence. And God chose by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God chose to let people identify. That's what I love about Scripture. In the Bible, Old and New Testament, it will point out the good, it will point out the bad. It will tell you the accomplishments, and it will tell you about the failures. And this is very helpful to me and to you, because I don't want us to feel the, the, um, just wore out over the fact that we've committed sin. When we commit sin, we do the very quickest, best way to get rid of that sin. I do not want you to feel deflated because of your sin, I want you to get rid of your sin. Now, that's what needs to happen right here. Those who follow the ways of the Sadducees had to give that up. And this is the way we have to do today. We give up anything that we have yielded toward that was a false doctrine or a false teacher. Now, you're going to see before we get through, and some of these will go from false teachers to um, false prophets to a variety of other ways that they are identified. But it's really important because so many people believe and they're taught, it doesn't really matter what you believe. You believe what you want to believe. You just open up your Bible, you read it, you accept that, and you believe that, and I'll open my Bible and read it, and I'll believe it, or I'll accept that, and move on. But let me tell you what, it doesn't matter what you believe. We must believe that thus saith the Lord. And we must believe and follow these things and make sure we don't follow false teachers. And what happens if false teachers arises within our rank, within our congregation, within our brotherhood? What happens? Well, the Word of God is pretty clear about it. I'll give you one verse, Titus 3 and 10. There's a list as long as you want to go about ways to deal with this. But in Titus 3 and verse 10, by itself, it makes it real clear. It said a man that is a heretic, and a heretic is one who causes strife and division by what they teach or preach. So therefore, a man that is a heretic, after the first admonition and the second admonition, reject. Now this is very interesting, and I want to keep this close to our mind, because this happens quite a bit. You have what the Bible here calls the first admonition. You warn them, you admonish them for what it is they're promoting or teaching and give them time. The, the book of Revelation said space to repent. And then give them some time and then eventually you would give them a second admonition. You do everything within your power to put an end or a rest to this heretical behavior and what being promoted. Now, hopefully, 
after the first admonition, things can be resolved. But if it doesn't happen eventually, and timing is a factor, there's nothing to indicate the timing. But it's a matter, if after the first admonition that they are silent and they don't do that anymore, then the case could be maybe over and they may have to uh, maybe not be put in the pulpit for an example. But if they are really hard nosed, then you have to have second admonition. And then if that does not solve it, the word of God says, then reject. You know, this word reject is just such a hard term to reject somebody. That's, that is so foreign from what we as New Testament Christians are prone to do. You know, where was it? All of us, we like to put our arm around people, give them a hug, and really show them you love them and you appreciate them. But when a false teacher comes along, that's no small matter. And we will not accept or endorse or embrace false teaching. We won't do it. You know, that's why the congregation here is known to be very straightforward, very conservative. We want to help strengthen the same, and we want to do away with anybody. And we don't have any here. That's a once a blessing. But there's probably been times people have crossed the poor pit where you have lived, and then all of a sudden you kind of raise an eyebrow when someone said something a little bit out of the norm. You have to say, okay, is there a scripture for that? And if there's not a scripture for it, that's wrong. You know, whenever young preachers, especially when I'm training different young preachers, and they say, you know, here's an idea that I've never heard explained before. I said, well, let me tell you something. If you've never heard it, it might be wrong. Okay? Because there's men who've been in the, studying this for years and years. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying, going in good, it may be wrong. So be, be ready to take it. And we've got to be ready to take things that are wrong and find out what's necessary in order to make it right and to make an improvement that's according to Scripture. Okay, much more can be said about the Sadducee and, the, and also this heretic, but you understand that Titus 3.10 makes that abundantly clear. Okay, now let's look at 2 Peter 2. Now we'll go from 2 Peter 2 to 1 John 4. Both of them are going to expose false teachers. And Peter is the apostle who gave the very first gospel sermon to people that they could obey in Acts 2. In Acts 2, verse 14, to be precise. And when Peter, the Bible said Peter stood up with the 11 and he lifted up his voice and he began to preach. And that is so wonderful. Well, here in 2 Peter 2, here's what Peter said. He said there were false prophets among the people. And then he made a comparison. Even as there should be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even deny the Lord that bought them, and were bringing to themselves swift destruction. Pretty serious stuff here. Verse 2. This is sad, but it's true. It happens today, too. Many, verse 2, many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be even spoken of. It is amazing to me that people can come up with some of the far out ideas and somebody's going to follow. That is amazing to me. It shows me that people don't know their Bible well enough. You need to know your Bible, whatever your translation or preference. That's fine with me. But you need to know it well. And when someone teaches, you know, the Word of God puts the responsibility on the teachers to present the truth. And it puts the advice to the, to the listeners, that's you and me, when we're being preached from the, in the sea, that we should search the Scriptures daily to make sure these things are so. That's Acts 17, verse 11. That's not on the board, so you have to write it down separately. Acts 17, verse 11, it said, you search the scriptures daily to make sure those things are so. You know, I, I tell people in a joking way that you become my best friend when you can show them a passage that maybe I have uh, overstated or understated or I didn't explain clear enough because I want to do that. I want to explain it correctly. I don't want there to be any maybes about it. I want to make sure it's right, or I want to leave it off and then go somewhere else to another passage. Well, here in this particular passage, what we learn is that he said, y'all are used to having a false prophet. Let me tell you what Peter said. Not only are they false prophets, they're false teachers too. 
And that becomes amazing. It really becomes amazing that in that whole day and time that they were false prophets. Now, on the same topic, the first John. So Peter wrote about it and John wrote about it. And that's the point I want you to take home with you. First John 4 and verse 1, right here. Look at what the apostle John wrote. John is the same one who wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. 1st John 4, verse 1. Beloved, Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they be of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. You cannot believe everything everybody who is spiritually minded says. You can't believe everything. You listen. You listen respectfully. You be kind, you be thoughtful, you be considerate, and you listen to what they say, and it's time for you to ask for a book, chapter, and verse. And then the Bible says we don't believe everything you hear. But this is the reason. The more you know about the Bible, the better you will be at discerning good and evil. Guess what? I didn't make that up. That's not an Alan Bailey quote. That is a Bible quote. Let's look at it. It's not on the board. But look at the last three verses, please, of Hebrew, the fifth chapter. And this shows how important it is for you to read and study your Bible, to know the Word of God, and how it can make you embrace things that are right and you turn away things that are wrong. But I want to read this passage because this should motivate us. I don't know if this one doesn't motivate us. I don't know what's going to motivate us, okay? Hebrew, the fifth chapter, the last three verses, we record the following thing. This is so important, and it helps. And I remember when this finally soaked into my head, I thought, wow, this is good, and it is wonderful. Verses 12 through 14, Hebrew 5, 12 through 14. Listen to what the Word says. For when for the time come, you ought to be teachers. You have need the one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And you're becoming such as have need of milk and not a strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he's a babe. <coughs> Verse 14. But strong meat belongs to them that are full age. Get hold of this now. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You know what? The more you know about the scriptures, the better you will be at discerning good and evil, right and wrong. That is a sense of consolation that you know your Bible well enough that if you hear something on the radio or at church or wherever you are and you hear somebody talking about spiritual things, that you go, no, no, I know my Bible better than that. And that's not right. The Bible said here, your senses are exercised. The more you use it, the better off you're going to be at that you can discern both good and evil. And it's so important to teach our kids that. Teach our friends and family and whoever we can. These verses are powerhouse passages and are so very useful. Well, 2 Peter and 1 John both illustrate two very these two passages and put in very important points. Now, Let's go to the last two, the book of Revelation. I kept this particular Bible marking shorter than some of the others are, even though you can have two or three of them this length. But let's look at Revelation, both of them in chapter 2. Now, the reason I want to go here is I want to show you what Jesus thought about false teaching and false doctrine. I want to show you how Jesus responded. Now, you know what Revelation 2 and 3 is? Chapter 2, chapter 3. It is the seven congregation of Asia. I began in chapter 2 with the congregation of Ephesus. But let's take a look at that. Look at Revelation 2nd chapter. And I'll show you a couple of things. I want to show you the false doctrine that they embraced and what Jesus thought about. Revelation, the 2nd chapter, let's look at verse 6. Now you, you can look at verse 1 if you want to to locate the congregation. It's the congregation of Ephesus. Ephesus is very unique. I, I have a sermon that I want to, I seldom preach it. I've only preached it a couple of times in a decade or so. But it, it includes a lot about the congregation at Ephesus. 
But the congregation at Ephesus is the only New Testament congregation that received inspired letters from two different writers. They received one from Paul, the apostle. They received this one here from Jesus. The only one that ever received two that we have a record of. Okay. The church at Ephesus, verse 2. Now let's look at verse 6. Now I'm, I'm skipping the good part. They did have some good things, but I'm not talking about good things. I'm talking about things that are not too good. Okay. Look at verse 6. But this I'll have. Now, that I'm talking about some bad stuff. You have those who hate the deeds of the Nicolaitan, which I also hate. Now, what's interesting is it's hard to find exactly who the Nicolaitan were, what they believed, what they taught. I've looked in many, many places. I've taught to many preachers, and, and it's just hard to put you a grip on it because it's hard to find it. Very little is given even historically, even going to historic. Nothing's given in scripture about it other than right here. And then there's another place that mentions it too. We're going to read it in a moment. But the thing is, when false doctrine happens, the Lord hates it. He hated the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And whatever there, and I, I, this week I was looking over and, and just hoping something would jump out at me. Oh, there, there it is. Somebody found it. No, nobody's finding it. It's just simply not much there. If you have it, but Revelation 2 and verse 6 makes this abundantly clear. Now, please, let's look at verse 14. And verse 14, now this is, by the way, the congregation of Pergamos. Now, you can back up to verse 12 and see the congregation identified. So we're leaving the congregation of Ephesus. Now, the church of Pergamos of verse 12, and look at verse 14. The Bible says, but I have a few things against thee. And you know, here it comes. The Lord is not uh, shy about pointing out mistakes, sin, false doctrine. But I have somewhat against thee, he said, because you have those that hold the doctrine of Balaam. We know a little bit about Balaam because the Bible said he taught Balaam to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed in the idols and to commit fornication. But it went on to say, verse 15, So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitan, again, which things I hate. My dear friends, whatever it was that Nicolaitan were doing or saying or acting, the Lord hated it. There's no need to try to water it down. I'll tell you what, we do not do anybody any favor by making them think everything's okay about what they believe is false doctrine. You're not doing them any good. You're not doing yourself any good. You're not doing the congregation any good because you like that guy. He's your friend. And I don't care who it is. Anybody that promotes false teaching, false doctrine, you know, they should be all given the right to correct and make things right with it. But it's very important that we stay with the truth of God's word. Now, what we need to learn from the Bible marking, the space on the false teaching angle is, that we be on our toes at all times. Don't let things get in your way. Do not be misled. Don't, your soul is too important for that. Oh, it's so in, interesting when you begin to look at all the doctors. I, I still have that sermon. I haven't preached it in quite a while, but you know why people draw the wrong conclusion on religious matters. And I, I got that one up because as I studied with people, I thought, how did you draw that conclusion? And, and they'd tell me, I said, do you mind if I make a note of that? I want to think about that and think about it and study a little bit. But then I began to accumulate different reasons why people draw literal good reasons why they draw false conclusions. But most times it's simply they don't know the Bible. And you don't tell them that. You don't, you don't try to be rude or inconsiderate. But you try to teach them, stay with the word. I want you to know, we have today, men and women, we have to stay with the word of God. We cannot embrace false doctrine, false teachers, false prophets, as we talked about in St. Peter 2. And you know what? In Revelation, if you were to keep reading, you find out they were false apostles. I mean, they had false everything. Did you know this? Every item of worship, singing, praying, teaching, communion, and contribution, every one of those has been tampered with by mankind and changed and altered. And people embrace and think, oh, isn't this wonderful? No, it's not. It's not wonderful. Did you know every doctrine from the virgin birth of Jesus to the end of the world and the resurrection 
has been off and changed. Every one of them. I don't know of a single one that's not bad. No, it's not good. It's terrible. I want you to know your Bible well enough that you immediately recognize what's false. You know, Brother Doug Edwards made a really good point that was of, I guess, a stabilizing force that helped me during a challenging time in Dallas when situations were not doing and going the very best they could and people using verses out of context one thing after another. And then uh, Brother Doug was is such a great Bible student. And he said, you know what's interesting about this article or about this particular letter, about this particular note that somebody wrote? They can have, you can have a document that has a lot of truth in it. Say it has 99% truth. Wow. But then it's hard to, and it has 1%. Sometimes it's hard to denote the false doctrine. When you got 99% truth, and they only have 1% that's not, sometimes it, get, it gets hid in all the truth. He said, now, on the flip side of that, if you were to have a situation like this document, and it was filled with Calvinism, and it was filled with all kind of false doctrines, maybe you'd recognize it just like that. Well, these some of these letters here, and he had listened to a bunch of tapes and saw a bunch of documents, one thing after another, and he just said, this problem is they contain enough truth to keep certain people persuaded. And they just dismiss these false doctrines and false teachings. And I remember saying, wow, I appreciate that. And that's true. That is very, very true. Because some people will have a certain portion of truth and they will hide behind that and they will just embrace these other doctrines that come along. Well, you've been a great audience, but this is not much that I'm going to say tonight. It's right in May 25. I just want you to use these verses. And if you choose to add more verses, just have at it, because these are very important. And it can be really important when you're studying with people who do not think it matters what you believe. And when that comes up, something along this line will be really, really helpful. And I really appreciate the opportunity to speak about these matters and, and to address them. Normally, of course, uh, tonight will be a chapter study night, but uh, we're honoring uh, Scott and Christian. They're on their 18th anniversary road trip, or maybe not road trip, but in Colorado. And so we hope for them the very best and to give him a night off and he can go do that. And he'll teach the next two, Lord willing, the next two Wednesday nights on Romans the eighth chapter. Good chapters. Uh, and it'll be wonderful. And he always does a great job. So we'll miss them, but we're glad they got to go and enjoy being together and enjoy them and congratulations to them for their anniversary. I just ask you to, to really take living a Christian life serious enough that you read your Bible, you study it, you obey it, and I don't care if it's me or anyone else. When they give the lesson, you take your Bible and you search the scriptures daily to make sure it's true. That's your part. It's my part to make sure it's true, but it's your part to make sure or double sure it's true. So if you're in this assembly tonight, if you have a spiritual need of any kind, we would welcome you to make me fry. And we'll help you every step of the way. We love you and we want you to go to heaven. And we want every one of us to work together that we can accomplish the good things that we need to according to Scripture. If you've never made the gospel, there's the water. We just need a candidate, and that candidate is you. If you've never made the gospel of baptism, you're old enough to read and write, and, you know, and you're old enough to make decisions, you're old enough to be baptized. We would love you to do that. If you've taken those steps and not live like you should, you have situations in your life you're not proud of, Repent of your sin, confession, Paul. We'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. Thanks, God. Watch that. Watch that.